It is June the 13th, Monday, 2016, and this is just a little off the wall. I thought that it might be kind of interesting for some of you to learn a few little fun facts. Maybe not fun, but just facts about um, the Bay of Fonda. We are home to the highest tides in the world here in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is just hop, skip, and a jump across the pond. Um, by boat, motorboat, you could do it in about two hours, two and a half hours, I think, somewhere around. The ferry that takes from Nova, from New Brunswick to Nova Scotia is about two and a half hour ride. So anyways, what I did was um, I had a comment from a viewer on YouTube for this, for this morning's video, and she called it Bay of Funny, <laughs> um, which made me think, yeah, okay, it's kind of funny. And people said, fun day, what a funny word, what a funny word that is. <clears throat> you have to excuse me. Um, I've got the sleepies. I was up at four till four, a little after four, and back up again at eight thirty or so. So I'm a little groggy and a little bit tired. But I wanted to do something here while I have a few precious quiet moments in the house right now. So I thought that I'd cover that. So anyway, I went straight to the heart of the matter to get some facts about the Bay of Fundé. So what I did was I went to Wikipedia and um, brought that up. If I can find it again, where did it go? There we go. Okay, so for those of you that might be interested, that's what this is for. So let me put my glasses on. Boy, do I need them this morning. Holy moly, just for reading, mind you. Okay, so I'm just going to clip off a few facts here. The Bay of Fundé is French, is pronounced as Bay de Fundé. And it is a bay on the Atlantic coast of North America on the north east end of the Gulf of Maine between the Canadian provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, with a small portion <clears throat> touching the U.S. state of Maine. Some sources believe the name Fundé is a corruption of the French word fendu, meaning split, while others believe it comes from the Portuguese funda, meaning deep. The bay was also named Bay Francaise, French Bay, by explorer and cartographer Samuel de Champlain. During a 1604 expedition lead, led by Pierre Duga de Sieur de Mont, which resulted in a failed settlement attempt on the St. Croix. And by the way, if you're interested in that, there's a whole thing written about the settlers on the St. Croix Island, and it was not pretty, it was bad. Anyways, people tried to settle there in the uh, in the dead of winter. Not good. The Bay of Fundy is known for having the highest tidal range in the world. Now, here's something I didn't know. It is rivaled by Ungava Bay in northern Quebec, King Sound in western Australia, the Gulf of Kumbat, Kumbhat, Kumhat in India, and the Severn Estuary in the UK. It has it has one of the highest vertical tide ranges in the world. The Guinness Book of Records, though, of World Records in 1975, declared that Fern Coat Head, Nova Scotia, has the highest tides in the world. That I did know. They're in the Minus Bay area. The natural world, greatest tides, the greatest tides in the world occur in the Bay of Fundy. Burn Coat Head in the Minus Basin, Nova Scotia, has the greatest mean spring range with 14.5 meters or 47.5 feet an extreme range of 16.3 meters to 53.5 feet. That is almost double what I get in my backyard, and I think we have high tides here, and they are high. They're, that's not to minimize the high tide marks here in the New Brunswick area um, on the St. John side. Portions of the Fundy Bay, Shepherdy Bay, and Minas Basin form one of six Canadian sites in the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, and it is classified as a hemispheric site. It is administered by the provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in the Canadian Wildlife Service, and it is managed in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. In July 2009, the, fund, the Bay of Fundy was named as a finalist for the Now Seven Wonders of the World of Nature contest. That ended in November 2011, and it was not chosen as a wonder. The Bay of Fundy is known for its high tidal range, the quest for world tidal dominance, has led to a rivalry between Minas Basin in the Bay of Fundé and the Leaf Basin in Ungava Bay, which over which body of water they lay claim to the highest tides in the world, with supporters in each region claiming the record. The Canadian Hydrographic Service finally declared it as a statistical tie. We are tied with the measurements of 16.8 meter or 55 foot 
tide, tidal range in Leaf Basin for Ungaba Bay in 17 meters, 56 feet at Burn Coat Head for the Bay of Fundy. The highest water level ever recorded in the Bay of Fundy system occurred at the head of the Minas Basin on the night of October 4th and 5th, 1869, during a tropical cyclone named the Saxby Gale. And I know about the Saxby Gale because when I first heard about it, I became very interested and I did a little bit of research. Just Google that. The water level of 21.6 meters or 71 feet resulted from the combination of high winds, abnormally low atmospheric pressure, and a spring tide. Leaf Basin has only been measured in recent years, whereas the Bay, <coughs> excuse me, the Fundy Bay system has been measured for many decades. The tide at Leaf Basin is higher on average, and tides at Minus Basin, however, the highest recorded tidal ranges even measured are at Burnt Coat Head and result from spring tides measured at the peak of the tidal cycle every 18 years. Traditional Micmac folklore states the tides in the Bay of Fundy are caused by a giant whale splashing in the water. Oceanographers attributed to tidal resonance resulting from a coincidence of timing. The time it takes a large wave to go from the mouth of the bay to the inner shore and back is practically the same as the time from one high tide to the next. During the 12.4 hour tidal period, 115 billion tons people of water flow in and out of our bay. The tides in the Bay of Fundy are semi-urinal -dur -dur and semi journal tides are tides that have two highs and two lows each day. The height that the water rises and falls to each day during these tides are approximately equal. Equal, yeah, equal. I told you I'm not awake. <clears throat> these are approximately six hours and 13 minutes between each high and low tide. So uh, now in the moment, they are looking for forms of, uh, to generate electric power. It's through the forces of the tide. They want to harness the movements of ocean water to generate electricity through a number of mechanisms. Currently in process of gathering tide energy called in-stream turbine technology is being tested in the Minas Passage, Nova Scotia. This project is being spearheaded by the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy, or F-O-R-C-E, force. In-stream tidal turbine technology is a relatively simple design. An elevated turbine is submerged underwater in a location that enables it its movement with tidal cycles. As the blades of the turbine move, they create an energy that powers an electric generator at the base of it. From here, the power travels to a cable attached to the seafloor and back to the off-site facility where it can be added to the power grid. While this technology has been shown to be successful in its early stages of testing, FORCE has not officially begun the process of energy collection. However, the installation of the undersea cable in December 2013 indicates that the project is moving along quite swiftly. The Bay of Fundy lies in a rift valley called the Fundy Basin. As the rift began to separate from mainland North America, volcanic activity occurred, forming volcanoes and flood basalts. These flood basalts poured out over the landscape, covering much of, the, of southern Nova Scotia. Sections of the flood basalts have been eroded away, but still form a, bas a, a basaltic mountain range known as North Mountain. As a result, much of the basin floor is made of theolitical lytic, lytic basal basalts, giving its brown color. The Rift Valley eventually failed. As the Mid-Atlantic Ridge continued to separate North America, Europe, and Africa. And it goes on and it goes on. And there's something about the uh, the middle Mid Atlantic Ridge as well. If you go to if you go to the Reversing Falls, our famous Reversing Falls, in our nearest city, uh, the oldest city in Canada, uh, incorporated city in Canada, uh, Saint John de Brunswick. If you go to Reversing Falls, there is a tourist layout there for you, and it talks about how Africa and the line between here and Africa. And it shows it on the map and how we were all before the tectonic plates all began to shift and separate, creating continents um, throughout the whole planet. That at one time it was like this and they can actually show and give you visual on this hard copy that is there and present it for the tourist. And then it, you can, you can't, I suppose if you could, you could kind of like eyeball what they're talking about. If you were going over by plane, you could definitely, I'm sure, see that. Very interesting place to live. I love where I live. Anybody that knows me really well 
knows my whole world is right here, literally, and figuratively, on both ends of that. Um, I'm very lucky to be where I am. Um, all along the coastline here, all the way up to the main border, I like to believe I have the prettiest spot here in my backyard. I have an island, Crow Island. Ancestors landed here almost 300 years ago. And there's a whole book written on that, The Tides of Discipline, on Champs Harbor, Dipper Harbor, Mesa's Bay, and La Crow area, surrounding little villages. Mainly fishing is the industry here, through all these little villages. And nothing much has changed in the 300 years that the people started to arrive. There's rich history here. Movies could be made. I've said that before. Movies could be made about here. At the end of my three-quarter mile beach, there's about that. There's a graveyard hidden behind a stand of evergreens. And it's completely surrounded by that. As the, the book, The Tides of Discipline, described it as the, at the end of the spit of the beach. And the very first person was buried there. And he's known as the Unknown Soldier. He was a British, a British officer. He was found by the first settler here in Chance Harbor, Daniel Belden. And he found him on the beach right out here, right in my backyard. He washed him at the tide. And Daniel thought that he deserved a decent burial. And he was the very first person built, uh, buried there at the end of the beach behind the stand of evergreens. And it's strange when you go down there and walk and you can see, and I can see the difference, especially me from tide to tide. When we get some wicked surf coming in that picks boulders up that are like this and tosses them like they're softballs. And you walk around that graveyard and, and sometimes the tide tide and we get the king tide with a surf like that. The surf will go and when it breaks it just roars over the headland and over the beach. The whole beach is underwater and it goes beyond that. And it throws these boulders and then it pulls away at the headland which causes a lot of erosion. So every time you go for a walk after a big surf like that, you see the changes from the beach to the headland that marks it. And it gets smaller and flatter. And before we know it, I, I'm watching it literally with every tide, the headland becoming more even. You used to be able to have to step down on the beach, and now it's just like this. It won't be long and they'll be even. But the funny thing is about that graveyard up there is untouched by the Bay of Fundy. And it's been there something like 200 and must be 80 years now. And no grave has ever been unturned because there are other graves followed from there. It's called the, uh, the Belding Grave Site. It's, it has different names. And the tides, for all the damage that they do and all that they take away from the land, has never, ever, ever. I think there's 21. I'll have to check the number. 21 souls buried in there. And no grave has ever been unturned. In the little, the little cedar post, the little picker, picker, picket posts that made of cedar that were originally planted there. A lot of them are still there. You can see them, how, what marks the graves. Um, it's an amazing place to live. Lots of good ghost stories. The history is so, so rich. The first settlers that landed here, they were unique and they were strong and they were tough. And some weren't so honest and crooked. With names like Charity French. I love that name. He, he was a, what you call a scab. He was a con artist. And I so picture him. I mean, there's no pictures of him, but I picture him as like, almost like one of the three musketeers, but I wouldn't dishonor them by saying he was like them. He may have looked that way. During that time era, long dark hair and a long black mustache and blue, hard, cold, evil eyes. There's a whole story behind him. Anyway, I could go on here forever. I just thought this would be a little bit of an interesting tidbit for my YouTube channel and my Facebook page, Bay of Fundy Fortunes, and just thought I would just change things up a bit for a Monday morning. So um, I wish you all a really good day. And, and this is Monday, uh, and I'm tired, and I'm still awake. Um, There'll be a nap in my day somewhere, I'm sure. It's raining here today and overcast, and it's been that kind of a journey. I don't mind the rain. I like the rain. I love the fog. I love it here no matter what the weather. So, my good friends, everybody, all my friends on Facebook and those that I'm making on YouTube as well, 
I wish you all a great Monday and hope you found those little tidbits a little bit interesting. We think we know everything about where we live and lo and behold, here's a few facts that just happened to pop up because I got a little bit curious. So I wanted to share that with you. Hope you all have a really great week ahead and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.